Well, class, the day for our nature wax finally got here, our biome uh, nature walk, field trip, is finally here. Anyway, it's a, it's a little rainy, so we'll see how we do. Abiotic factors are what cause the biomes. So in our nature, in our field trip today, let's be looking for some, uh, what the abiotic factors are that do control the biomes. And in the desert, of course, what is it? You guessed it, water. And since it rained a little bit, we got a little water coming across this little wash out here in the desert. Isn't that cute? Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Anyway, you can see in the top of the mountain way over there, they got some snow. And these lower hills over here, some snow. So they're going to get some runoff. That's going to run off quickly when it warms up. And in this little wash here, we have some annuals that sprout up really quick. And, and uh, we got these uh, say, uh, wild oats here and things like that. And the desert gets about uh, 25 millimeters of precipitation a year. We talked about how the creosote bush has this little hill behind it. And I told you I would show you what happens over long eons of periods of time. See this hummock right here, this hill? It's surrounded on the outside of it and over the top by creosote bush. Now, that is... They've done studies, and they found that one little creosote bush like this thousands of years ago started this hummock right here. And uh, you have one little bush, so all these bushes that have come off of it have come off from uh, branch roots or branching out and, and forming other bushes around it. So this is considered one plant. Remember back when we were studying genetics, if you clone something, which what these would be, they'd be exactly the same genetically as the original because they are. They all came from the original plant. So these hummocks right here are very interesting. They're older, they say, than uh, the bristlecone pine up in the high, high mountains and also older than the redwoods. Here's our next stop on our field trip. Of course, we're still in the desert, but our desert is starting to change a little bit. This beautiful ocotillo all flowered out, blossoms on it. Ocotillo will blossom very rapidly. If, the, if they get just a little bit of rainfall, they will blossom quickly in just a matter of days. Right here we have a, uh, a Choya cactus, or some people call it a, a teddy bear cactus, some people call it a jumping cactus, because it seems like those, uh, those walls will jump off. And then right over here, we got a barrel cactus coming up. So in this area of the desert, we're getting a transition or a change from the low desert to the little higher desert. So this is what we would call a transition zone. A transition zone. It's changing, transitioning from one biome to another. Beautiful. Over here we have some yucca starting to show up or century plants. Notice this one has a long spike coming out the top, but we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Right here we have a beautiful plant with these beautiful red flowers on it. Some people call this Indian paintbrush or desert paintbrush. Here's something you don't see very often in the desert. This is a beaver tail cactus blossoming out. All these desert plants. Here we have some tracks. They look kind of like deer tracks, but they're heavy and wider and more pointed. I believe these are desert bighorn sheep tracks going across here. This plant here, we've got something growing here. There's this orange uh, fibrous, hairy looking stuff on here, right here, right here. And this plant here is covered with it. Okay, now who's going to know what this is. Anybody got a guess? What is this? It looks like these plants that it's growing on aren't doing too good. This is called daughter. Not daughter like my daughter, my, the girl, but daughter. And it's a parasitic plant. We find it in the Imperial Valley sometimes in the alfalfa fields. 
be one of our last shots of the desert and it is alive with flowers right now. I wish you all were along. And we have right here, we talk, said we'd talk about this again later. This is the yucca plant or century plant. And it seems like they blossom like once every century. I don't think that's true, but they have a symbiotic relationship with a moth that's found only associated with this plant right here. And if this moth doesn't exist, they can't pollinate their flowers, which are on the tip up here. And so the moth, of course, benefits. It gets the pollen from the flower and the, the plant, of course, benefits because it has to have that moth to be able to pollinate its flowers. So we're headed up this canyon and you can see our desert is changing. This is the transition zone, changing from one to another. And the reason we stopped right here is, what do we got right here? It looks kind of like grass to me. That's important, pay attention to that. Okay, this little canyon right here is called San Felipe Creek and water runs here year round. In the summertime, it slows down and barely has a few pools in it. But because there's water here year, year round, there's a little minnow that's found in this uh, little creek. It's called desert pupfish, and it's this uh, individual species. And this is the only little creek it's found in. And uh, we're going to go upstream a little bit and see if we can find a few of those. There goes my beautiful wife, Lynn came along on the full trip. I wish all of you could be along. So what is important about this little canyon right here, other than it has a species of fish in it that's found no place else in the world? Well, this represents a microbiome. A microbiome is an area that's very small, that's different from the other biomes around it. Now, this should not be here, but it's here, and it's different because of what? What abiotic factor? The elevation here, probably up at about 1,000 feet, maybe 1,200 feet in elevation. So the elevation's changed. Obviously, the amount of uh, precipitation's changed. Uh, temperature, what do you think? We have these plants here. Now, we've been looking for that little pupfish, and actually, we have a few of them right over here in this area, around this little grassy place. You probably can't see them because they're about uh, an inch or an inch and a quarter long and not very many. This whole canyon right here has very, very few of them in. Remember we were talking about primary succession? This giant granite rock here with all these things falling off here and we have right here, this piece has fallen off very recently and these other ones, you see how they shine? These are new splits split off recently. So in primary succession starts with rock. You can see up in here there's a few lichens that are waiting for a little more moisture before they get going or a little more warmth. Plants in here. See the cracks right here? In the winter time water can get down in here. Then when it freezes cause that rock to split. And eventually, how long would it take this rock right here to split off its parent rock up above? Uh, maybe, maybe thousands of years. Primary succession. And then we have the extra part that it's in the canyon here. Water's going to wash down. You see all these other rocks over here, the smaller rocks that have been broken off and chipped off by the action of the water. This does flood periodically. You can see the water's been up as high as here, or even up as high as here, above my head. And so the water action, the hot and cold action, the freezing action, the plant roots getting down between the rocks would cause, you know, a bush up here, its plant roots are gonna grow down in that crack, or have grown down in that crack. 
the roots would cause that to eventually split off there, cleave off. Primary succession. Okay, we're going to be leaving our microbiome here, the San Felipe Creek, our little pupfish. But before we do, what do we got in this tree right here? It looks like some kind of parasite. And I would be calling it mistletoe. Okay, this area we're looking at here, we're up in a little plateau. We came through the canyon back this way, and we came out to this flat area here. And this is definitely a transition zone. These are mesquite trees in here. And what do we have out there? Remember the patch of grass we saw back in the canyon? The little patch, I told you it's going to be important later. Well, here grass is showing up again. We're going to transcend, make a transition from the desert biome to a grassland biome. Coming right up. Well, class, here we are. We found the grasslands. We passed through the desert biome. Now we're in the grassland biome. Grasslands uh, it's called the savannas, the steppes. The Great Plains, the Great Plains area of the United States, eastern Colorado, all the way to the Mississippi River from northern Texas all the way up to the Canadian border and on up into Canada. That's the Great Plains. In, in Russia, they call them the steppes. In the uh, African continent, they call them the uh, savanna. Down in uh, South America, the very tip of Argentina, or not the very tip of Argentina, but in southern Argentina, they have steppes also. So the predominant plant, of course, is grass. The soil is very fertile. And let me turn the camera around so we can get a better look. Okay, we're going to get down here a little bit. The grasslands, we talked about where they're found. Abiotic factors, they have hot summers. Now the summer here won't be as hot as the Imperial Valley Desert, because we're up probably about uh, 1,500 to 1,800 feet. But they have hot deserts. Um, cold winters. Up on the mountain here, it just got obscured by the clouds. There's snow up on those mountains right there. So it probably does snow here occasionally. They have a seasonal precipitation. That means it's going to come in the spring on through early spring and then they'll have a summer that's hot and dry this will all dry up and then they'll have a fall season when they'll have lots of rain again soil is very rich and productive because these grasses and these other plants here have fibrous roots that go down into the ground they don't go really deep maybe uh, 18 or 24 inches deep maybe a little bit deeper than that maybe 36 inches but they're fibrous and they, they uh, hold the soil. And also when the, when the plants die, the, the uh, dead material just builds up on the soil and uh, produces humus, which has a lot of organic matter in it. So it's very soil, very fertile soil. Okay. Uh, as far as living things here, the biotic factors, the, the fauna, we're going we're gonna to find uh, uh, jackrabbits. Gophers, prairie dogs, this is a, a gopher hole right there, or ground squirrel holes. Uh, antelope, probably uh, when the first pioneers came into this area here, there were antelope found here, and maybe a few bison or buffalo. There were buffalo in California. So this whole valley area here probably had buffalo at one time in it. Uh, coyotes, of course. Uh, hawks, uh, uh, buzzards, eagles. Now this, this type of plant is resistant to, uh, here they, in a natural prairie or grassland area, they all have frequent uh, fires that will go through the area and just uh, take out the top portion, but the fibrous roots and the crown of the plant survive and it grows back. Average precipitation in the grassland up to 300 centimeters which is about eight feet of precipitation a year. Let's look around a little bit more. Seems like we have the ever-present ant. They were in the desert also. And of course, they're scavengers. And hopefully, 
you catch the sound of the metal lark. There it was. Again, you can hear the metal lark in the background, but in the desert biome, we have annuals that will grow very rapidly. All these uh, beautiful little flowers. Some people call that a bluebell. And I don't know what these beautiful little pink flowers would be called. So even though the desert uh, or the grassland biome looks like it's monotone, in other words, it only has one plant, grass, that's its predominant plant, but there are hundreds of other species of plants that are found in the desert biome. Try to catch a picture of that crow flying by. In the desert, or in the grassland biome, where we have streams and rivers, very often you would find cottonwood trees along the edge of them. The cottonwood tree is very common in the grasslands of the United States anyway. And these are cottonwood trees right along the edge of a, of a uh, stream, uh, a seasonal stream that runs out into that grassland area we were in. And in this area here, we just we tried to get a picture of that crow going by. There'd be different organisms because we have different plants. Now, think of the antibiotic factors that are controlling this. In, in the grasslands, we will find cactus. They're a little bit different looking than the ones we find. These are, this is the beaver tail, but probably a different species. Much larger, lar longer spines on it, thorns. And then we got the antler, the thicker branches. This is what we call a transition zone again. This is uh, changing from our grassland, which is out here. That's our grassland area. Prairie area, steps area would look just like that. And we're going to be changing to a shrub uh, environment, the chaparral. It's going to be gradual, but we'll be there in a minute. Well, class, here's our next biome we want to talk about. It's called the chaparral. Your book calls it the temperate woodland and shrubland, but it's called the chaparral. It's found in, in uh, Southern California along the coast, along these mountains that we are, are west of us. And it's also found around the Mediterranean Sea and a few other areas of the world where this climate is the same. So let's take a, a closer look at the chaparral. Okay, here we can see it right here. We, of course, from the rainfall, we have a little water here, but you can see it's thick brush. And that's why they call it a brush land. Okay, turn around over here. It's got a lot of the flowers still from down in the desert area. How would you like to try to walk through there? It's almost impossible to walk through there unless you can find a trail that's been made by a, 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 an elk or a deer or something and follow it through. It's almost impossible to get through. Okay, abiotic factors of the uh, chaparral. Dry summers. Moist winters, and we got a little rainfall still coming. The soil is very thin. It's not like the grassland soil, which was very thick. The soil here is very thin. You can see the rock, right? You can see the rocks underneath our, our plants right here. And right up here on this ledge, you can see the rock. So these bushes uh, have very thin soil underneath them. In other words, there's very, very little humus. Okay, they have, uh, so it's nutrient poor as far as that goes. But also, there's a picture of it. The hillsides are covered with these thick bushes. Also, they have periodic fires here, which you should know. They had a, they've had a number of fires in recent years uh, in, in Southern California. Okay, plant life. Of course, these thick bushes have an occasional oak tree or an occasional uh, larger shrub they have tough waxy leaves now these tough waxy leaves help conserve water so if we look at the leaves right here they're tough they're pretty tough and they're kind of waxy which helps conserve water this one right up here you can see this is a 
what you call a, uh, I call it mountain oak. It's a type of oak, has tough waxy leaves. They usually have a lot of oil in their, in their uh, stems and things. That's why they burn so well, uh, so fast. Animal life, coyotes, snakes, lizards, squirrels. Now we're starting to see squirrels, not ground squirrels, but squirrel squirrels. Uh, no prairie dogs like down in the grasslands, deer, bobcat, mountain lion. This is the chaparral. There's a good picture of it on this on this hillside right across from us here. Bushes. The chaparral is bushes. It's a beautiful example of a... It's such a good time to be here. I wish you, again, that you're able to be with us on this field trip. You can describe things, but actually seeing things makes a difference. Look at this beautiful uh, plant right here. It's another type of oak. You tell the oak, I think this is called California oak. The reason they say I call it that is because the rule is California oak makes a boat. The leaf is kind of like a little boat. Can you see that right there? It's kind of a cup shaped. So the California oak makes a boat. Some deer tracks, they're old, but they're definitely deer tracks. This thick bush here, I believe, uh, I call it Mount Mahogany. You see underneath, it's starting to build up some humus. And, and these periodic fires, these will burn uh, very rapidly. And we follow this little trail here, this little deer trail. See, to get through here would be impossible. Unless you had a trail to follow. If we go back in here, we're starting to see lichens showing up. These are definitely lichens growing right here in moss. Moss and lichens mixed together. Uh, moss, moss, moss and lichens mixed together right here. Beautiful little spot right here. Mountain lilac. Thick brush. That's the chaparral. Look off through there. Now this right here, this is evidence. This has been burned. This has been burned. So there's been a fire through this area. And these plants are adapted for, for fire. Uh, you can see down in here, I don't know if you can see this, blackened area. That's where it burned. These plants will burn down, but as long as the fire passes through the top and doesn't destroy the, the root system, the crown of the plant, it will grow back. So this is this area here has been burned over, uh, let's say, 20 years ago. It's probably taken it 20 years to grow back. We've got to get a picture of this beautiful flower here in the chaparral. And look at the leaves. The leaves are fuzzy. These leaves aren't real tough, but they're fuzzy. And that's an adaption underneath. They're fuzzy because the stomata where all the transpiration takes place. Remember the water cycle, transpiration leaving from the plants? Most of the transpiration occurs through the stomata, which are on the most plants have it on the underside of the leaf. So these uh, little hairs underside, on the underside of the leaf help conserve water by restricting the amount of wind that blows across the leaf and making water evaporate from it, transpiration. Here's a one right here. This one here. This one does have thick, uh, thick leaves, kind of tough, but it's also fuzzy. Another adaption for uh, drought seasons in the summer. Another shot of the chaparral with these beautiful purple flowers in full blossom. These are these are bushes that are in full blossom. You see they cover this whole hillside here. You can see again the brush with the occasional. Uh, little short open spaces where will be annuals growing and and, and uh, grasses. Chaparral. Well, everyone, I'm back. This is our last stop in the chaparral biome. I'm going to taste one last look at it. Here we are. Our chaparral biome. Some beautiful little meadows down in there. Hills covered with thick bushes, 
So it's kind of cloudy, but we are going up there. The edge of the clouds, see those little buildings up there? That's where we're headed. Right now we're at about uh, 3,000 feet. That's going to be up there at about uh, 5,000 feet. But before we get there, we're going to be stopping at the dis be before we get there, we'll be stopping at the deciduous forest. The deciduous forest characterized keystone species are deciduous trees. You, you see this tree right here uh, is just starting to green up and get new leaves after the winter's been over. There's another one right over here next to it. Right up here, these bushes also right on the other side right here. Deciduous trees lose their leaves in the winter. Now that produces a real thick humus underneath. It's very fertile soil. The, the deciduous forest also has the beginnings of pine trees in it. So this is our deciduous forest. A thick forest, thick leaves, grass in the open spots. Here's the thick humus we were talking about, building up uh, uh, from these dead leaves. Very fertile soil. Okay, we've got uh, moss and lichens on the tree here. These uh, gray areas, that would be lichens, and the moss is the green area. Okay, and over here to the side, see this white uh, stuff on the ground? That's snow left over from this morning. They had a light snow this morning. So this is your uh, temperate forest or your deciduous forest. Very, very much, very good example of it right here. Okay, and it's a lot of the plants, uh, they don't have very many leaves on them right now. Because, why? Because this is a deciduous forest and they lost their leaves uh, last fall. And that produces, again, this thick humus, these dead leaves underneath. Okay. And uh, the uh, keystone plants, or flora, that would be, of course, be the uh, deciduous trees. And uh, animals, animals in uh, this, the climate of this area here is, uh, they have uh, very cold winters that are snow and warm summers, but not hot like in the Imperial Valley. Elevation we're at now is probably about um, uh, 4,000 feet. Uh, we've got a little higher to go. The, the animals that you would find here, um, naturally, uh, many of them would hibernate in the wintertime. Another shot of our deciduous forest, the moss on the trees. Animals in this area, the natural animals that would be found would be bear, Squirrels, but a different kind of squirrel, larger squirrels, deer, mountain lion, uh, and of course, in, in a natural environment, there would be wolves. If you listen carefully, you can hear a stream. There are a lot of streams down in the deciduous forest. The rainfall, we'll get to that uh, in just a minute. And that's the stream. Okay, deciduous forest, you can see the uh, green leaves just starting to bud out way on the top. Okay, talking succession, this stump you see right here is burned off. There's another one right over here. But you can see where it's burned down around the bottom and you have these new uh, branches that have come up from the bottom. Over here further, you can also see burned off trees. This area was burned off approximately 25 years ago. And in succession, you can see the smaller plants underneath. It's got the layers, smaller plants, and they've got the shrubs, the bushes, the larger bushes, and then the trees 
are starting to come back. You've got this tree right here starting to come back. Succession. It's a very good example here of uh, pond succession. This area obviously at one time had some kind of a pond in it and it's filling in from the sides and from dead material in the bottom. There we go. Someday this will all fill in. This will be a marshland across here. Eventually we'll fill in, it'll be just a solid meadow across there. Sec uh, pond succession at its best right there. Okay, talking about primary succession, these rocks here are weathering on top. They're wet now, but you see the cracks right here? They fill in with water. It froze last night here, and that freezing will squeeze off just a little bit of, of rock. And that rock all comes down it, it floats down. We start getting pieces of rock like this. Smaller pieces of rock like this. Okay. And then it mixes with the uh, humus, the organic material from the plants, and we start getting soil. Another contributor to uh, primary succession is lichens. These are lichens here, and they're going to cause just little fragments of rock to, to flake off. The beginning of making the soil. Primary succession at its best. Well, class, we came from way out there, down in the desert, all the way up to the coniferous forest. That's our nature walk. Well, class, that wraps it up for our biome film trip. We went from the desert all the way up to the coniferous forest. We passed through desert, grasslands, chaparral, deciduous forest, and now we're up here on top of the mountain at the coniferous forest. This beautiful pine tree behind us has moss growing on the north side of it. Just want to let you know that don't give up, keep working hard. This whole thing with this virus is going to pass. I love you all. You take care. See you when I see you. God bless. Talk anthrums. Hey, when we talk, when we talk about anthrums, we're talking about a biome such as our desert here that's been changed to a different biome. This one is a crop, what they call in our textbook, a cropland or farmland. We've got Mount Signal on the... Okay, wrapping it up for anthrums. Over there, uh, across the valley, we stopped and we looked at a field full of uh, canola, or rapeseed, it's called, uh, or rapeseed. It's used to make a very fine oil. Then we passed a field uh, a little further back that uh, was just had sprinklers on it, been plowed up. Behind me, this is sugar beet field. So our anthrum here in the Pira Valley obviously is farmland and we have altered it, we've altered the biome to an agricultural area for our benefit. Nothing wrong with doing that. That's what we call it nowadays. Candy cottage. Can't beat it. Class, when we talk about anthrums, partly artificially created biomes by man, I'd like to let you visit my favorite one. It's called, got it, Candy Cottage, and yeah, the best candy in the world, located up the boulevard of the mountains, halfway to San Diego.